So, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning on the EDC Coffee Chat, Coffee with Colleen. Really appreciate you joining us, and also that the general manager of Column Transit, Kevin Galachi. Did I say that right, Kevin? Galachi or Galachi? Galachi. Galachi. It depends on what Galachi you taught you ask. So okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so really appreciate Kevin and Jim, his operations manager, joining us today um, to share with us a bit about our transit authority for Clallam County. And so just a quick review, make sure that you are on mute so that we don't hear any background noise. And if you have any questions of um, Kevin, then please put either put your hand up or put your question in the chat and I'll be sure to call on you and you can answer, ask your question. And I see also council member Lindsay is on with us. And as I um, noted, he is the chair of your board for Clallam Transit. Is that right, Kevin? That is correct. Yep. So um, thanks also, Lindsay, for joining us. Um, so Kevin, if you would like to take it away, we'd love to get a bit of an education on our transit authority for Clallam. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. So good morning from uh, up here at the top of the truck route where the <clears throat> sun's uh, busting through the fog here. So it looks great outside. Um, I brought Jim Fetzer along, or not brought him along, but it asked him to join here um, in case there are some questions that I can't answer as he is our operations manager and uh, very well educated in that side of the, of the organization. Um, so with the introduction that Colleen sent out uh, talking about overview of our system and some of our future plans, I thought this would be a great time to, to share um, a report from our uh, comprehensive operational analysis that we work with the consultant um, here uh, this year, uh, beginning in about November of 2020. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the presentation up and running here. Okay, looking okay on that end? Yeah. Looks good, Kevin. All right, so um, we, we be, uh, began the, uh, this operational analysis back, like I said, in November, 2020, um, with anticipation to look at how we serve the community with transit, and what we could do to um, possibly serve better. Um, we, we've actually, um, have done these types of analysis in the past. And it's nice to have a consultant come in and uh, take a look at our system and give us some recommendations. What we didn't know at the time is that we would um, be able to uh, fund some additional services. So it was perfect timing to help us, uh, give us the tools and the data we needed to, to do that. So, um, so what I'm gonna go over here is uh, kind of a little, uh, study recap and some of the highlights on our performance of our system and our fair policy and funding availability. Ability. Um, some feedback from our project advisory committee and um, also service, the service change recommendations that came out from our, uh, the work of the consultant here. And then our next steps moving forward. So, our, this slide <clears throat> talks about our system performance. And I won't get into a, a whole lot of, of detail over on the charts to the right, but basically um, our urban routes, the 20, the 22, 24, and 26, those are, those are um, in-town Port Angeles routes. And so there's more density within um, the population. So obviously there's, those are gonna be higher performers. And then the inner city routes are, um, very high performing as well. Um, that's the forks route and the swim routes and then the straight shot route. Some of the rural routes um, going to Joyce, Nia Bay, um, out to Diamond Point. Um, some of those routes are they're longer distance and they have fewer passers. But um, again, we serve the whole county. So um, we can't always just look at efficiency on our routes. We need to, you know, we need to consider coverage as well for some of those lifeline. Uh, communities out there that really depend on transit. Um, 
our fair box to jump ahead to our fair box revenue. Um, our fair box reco recovery ratio is is eleven point seven percent. So um, we're you know heavily subsidized by sales tax and operating grants at Transit. Um, so that's why that number is very low. A lot of people are kind of surprised at that, but um, the service is there for folks to use, and um, the recovery on the fares is not is not uh, very um, is a is a very small uh, portion of our revenue. So um, to kind of break it down, sales tax is about seventy five percent of our of our revenue operating revenue. And um, we receive about another 12% um, in operating grants through federal or state um, sources. So Kevin, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. I, so I'm looking at this, like um, the middle graph and it says service type inner city operating costs $14,002. So is that for a day or for one, uh, what what does that indicate? Yeah, Jim, what is, is that? That's not, I know that's not a day. Um, is that our monthly total then? Jim? I think Jim's on mute. Okay. Um, average fair operating cost, operating cost is. So you stumped me already on the first question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. I will confirm that. Um, I, I think it looks like we lost Jim. Oh, here he is. Jim, you there? Yeah, I apologize. My internet connection back here is going in and out. But no, that is by month. I that apologize. Month. The delay in the answer there. Yeah. Got it. Thank yeah. you. All right. So by month, so for all inner city or like one route, one bus per month. I mean, that seems really low if it's one yeah. month. Yeah, if you look at the all? the inner city routes, the 14 to 30 and the and the straight shot, that's the cost per month for those routes up in the first section. Okay. Got it. I'll, let me make a correction. I it's by week. My apologies. I'm I'm a little rattled here because my phone's on. My I'm having trouble, but it is a weekly total. Okay, thanks. That makes right. sense. Yeah, be yeah. nice if that was a little more specific on the graph there, but anyway, so, okay. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, That's why you're here. Yeah, sorry about the mix up. I'm happy to help and get your graphs a little bit more um, <laughs> yeah. uh, informative. Defined? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, so here, Here's a um, further system performance review, and this talks about weekday boardings. And so, you know, if you look down in the middle there, you can see the um, the weekday boardings are much higher on those um, routes that serve the denser population. A lot of people on and off in, in town, and even the, the commuter has great ridership. And the second half of that graph just shows the, shows the mileage that uh, we're traveling. But you look down at the straight shot at the bottom, I mean, it's a very successful service and has um, a higher ferry recovery. But again, because of the mileage, it, um, you know, the boardings are not quite as much. So 72 miles each direction. So, um, so basically, again, our system is um, based more on, you know, coverage than performance because um, we, again, serve the entire county. So. Hey, one more question on that. I know I'm not following my own rules and putting up my hand, but I would call on myself. So go ahead, Colleen. Yeah. Um, so the Highway 101 commuter, mm -hmm. I see that's the big boarding, a lot of people boarding, which doesn't at all surprise me. I've written it before. Um, do you see like more people going in the morning, going from Squim to Port Angeles than Port Angeles to Squim? I would guess there's more people living in Squim and they work in Port Angeles, especially like at Olympic Medical Center and such. Is that? Yeah. So Jim, the peak hours, Jim can talk about the peak hours on that um, as well. So uh, they, we do track that and that's not um, described here. In this, so um, Jim, are you still online there? Jim, 
He must be having internet trouble okay. again. He's there, not on mute. Yeah, can you hear us now? Hello? Yeah, yes. I can hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the commuting patterns on that are really strange, but in the morning we see a lot of people coming in from SQUIM, but the, the volume is actually heaviest during mid-morning and midday, where we have a lot of people shopping and traveling back and forth between the city, so it's, it's kind of unusual. We do have some commuter population, but the heaviest ridership is in the middle, actually the middle of the day. Oh, that's interesting. So like going to the big box stores in SQUIM? Well, to swim and then people coming over here to shop as well in Port Angeles. Okay. So, huh. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. So you're supporting our local economy. Thanks for doing that. So that they can um, spend and improve sales tax revenues to feed yourself. Yeah, there. <laughs> Comes right back to us. Um, so... Just some more on our system performance review here. So this uh, demonstrates the passengers per hour um, on the routes. And then where we get into cost per passenger, um, as you can see the graph there, some of the um, example is the EMEA Bay is up over 50 some dollars per passenger, uh, Diamond Point as well. Um, and you get down into the uh, Port Angeles routes in the higher density areas, and those costs go down due to the, um, the increase in passer hours. So um, really hard to balance this all over the system, but because again, we're not about the efficiencies always, we're about the um, being able to, um, you know, um, serve all the communities within Palm County. So any questions on this one before I move ahead? So our current um, fare policy and structure was um, also looked at in this analysis. Um, to the right is our, our fares. And so we've only had a couple of fare increases in, over the many years that I've been here that I can recall. Um, and so this is going to be part of our discussion here um, with our, our board moving forward. Um, first, we're going to talk about our service improvements, but within that, we're still going to talk about um, where we want to go with our fares and if we want to increase those or balance those fares out, um, or there's been even um, suggestions of, of fare-free um, for our system, too. Um, so the, uh, the consultant actually um, recommended, had some recommendations basing um, some of the fare structure off of mileage. Um, I, that to me gets a little complicated. And so we, we, need to, we need to take a close look at this and we don't wanna make this so complicated that customers can understand it as well. Um, as you do know, the straight chop fare is, we set that fare much higher than the rest of the system as we could because it was a regional connection. Um, and I think that's a, a good price for that. I, I've had um, the public comment that they would pay more for that service. And we do have some programs in place that um, will reduce fares for low income folks through um, nonprofit ag agencies as well. So we, we do have that in place at this time. Um, so the one of the areas that we really need to take a close look at is a paratransit fare. So we charge the same fare for paratransit service, which is mandated that we offer paratransit service with, within three quarter miles of our fixed route service. Um, but that is our most expensive mode of, of service in, in the uh, county. And we have the ability to charge twice the base fare for that service. So that'll be um, something in our discussions in the future as well. Um, any questions on that? Actually, I was gonna, I raised my hand. So, uh, <laughs> um, so you mentioned the straight shot fare. Is that route one two three or which yes. one is how much? Yes, okay, the, the route one two three. So okay, got it. Thanks. Oh, I clapped for myself instead of raised my hand. I'll get this right. Thanks. Yep. So <clears throat> um, what? Um, happened here throughout last year is um as i again as i said in 
November 2020 when we started this uh, project, we were not aware of our, our funding. And as we were building our uh, budget for um, 2021, we were actually um, preparing for service decreases. And that was something we were going to have the um, consultant look at as well, too, to help us out in areas where we could decrease services if necessary due to budget constraints. Um, Due to uh, the CARES Act, um, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, Kalam Transit received $4.4 million for tra providing transit service. Later, we received the second batch of funds, the CRISA funds, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplementar Supplemental Appropriations Act funding at seven, just um, just under $7.5 million to go towards transit operations. Um, some of the um, formulas in, in these funds coming to transit agencies were some of the large agencies had a huge uh, deficit in their budgets due to, um, they, they have a higher fare collection. So uh, they were um, having to cut services and the revenue was way down. Uh, our sales tax um, actually stayed um, very stable in Colum County. Actually, it was higher than what we had budgeted. So we're using these funds to support our operations and then our excess sales tax is going in to build our reserves. Um, so currently we're sitting at about 13.2 million of reserves. And by 2022, we're going to be looking at about 17.2 million. And so we owe it to the public to, I, I believe, our customers to put these funds um, in additional services back onto the street and utilize these. And we don't want to ex um, expand our service so largely that we have a, a deficit or a, um, we can't continue to sustain those services in the years out. So um, we put together that I'll go over a plan here um, in the future for expanding services. So the um, consultant budgeted about an additional $1 million a year for service. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with that because <clears throat> that drives a lot of other co cost factors. And, uh, but I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in the <clears throat> further slides here. Uh, Kevin, I've got a question. Do you guys have a policy on how many months of reserves you need to have? Um, we don't actually have a written policy on the months um, of reserve. We have a reserve amount that we keep in operating and capital. The amount that we have in um, operating is, I believe it's typically about four months of operation, four, actually four to six months of operation. That number fluctuates. Um, an example is when we apply for federal grants and we have to pay the 20% match. Example is 10 heavy duty buses at 500 some thousand dollars a piece. We have to have cash flow in our account to pay for those buses. And then later we get reimbursed from the state and the feds through that grant program. So we need to have not only, um, it, you know, it's a good business practice to have a reserve in there in case sales tax was um, got cut off for a period of time or what have you, or we had um, a reduced revenues where we had to prepare for service reductions. But on the other side of that too, we need to have cash in our bank account to pay for um, capital expense or match for the uh, capital expenses. So to answer your question, no, it's not a specific number that is in the policy. Okay, thank you. So um, on this slide here, and we'll talk more about um, our different uh, service improvement cost scenarios. So this, in this slide here, um, this is just demonstrating our hourly costs for um, operating transit. So it's at $94 an hour, and that's also considering um, the, um, the administrative services we have in place right now. So that's not adding um, those into that figure. So if, if we were to add 
had three hundred thousand dollars a year um, of service, that would buy about five percent increase in fixed route, um, twenty six hundred additional service hours, and three percent increase in paratransit service of about nine hundred fifty additional hours a year. And then we broke down the uh, cost by wages, benefits, supply services in the left hand column there. And again, so, all um there is a question here. Um, Kimberly, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, I, I was just curious when you were talking about the, I'm not sure what you called them, but the wheelchair accessible buses. Yeah, paratransit. Uh, and, and you said that they had to pay a higher fee. I wondered why that is just because I, I realize it costs more to operate, but it just doesn't seem to be fair because of their special needs. Right. So currently they don't pay, they don't pay a higher fare. So in our um, current fare structure, but um, we do have the ability to um, uh, charge twice the base fare for the paratransit services. So which is not happening right now, but will be a discussion in the future and doesn't mean that we are going to do that. So. Thank you. Yeah, and we would also have a public comment period um, before we did that as well. So, um, and we would consider the comments from the public, so. Great, um, and I think Priya has a question along those lines too. Priya? Um, yeah, so my question was with regards to, you know, the potential for increasing costs for Clallam Connect services. I know mm -hmm. that, again, for individuals who ride who have special needs, they're on extremely limited income. Are you thinking of consulting with the rider pool um, before you raise fares at that? that I, I know it costs so much more to operate that than the fixed route system, but I, I think it has huge impact on the riders if um, there's an increase in that service system. Yeah, and look, I don't wanna get everybody excited. We're, you know, this is just the discussion so, um, that we'll have. So I, again, you know, our, at the end of the day, we may call them tra transit, may decide to have a fare free service or we may continue with our current fares, but, um, we certainly want to uh, take in consideration those comments and what the effect that has on our customers. So um, I'm not at this time, um, you know, promoting that increase. I'm just saying that's the ADA law allows for that. And that was pointed out by the, the consultant as well. Um, internally, we are doing a lot of things to uh, make paratransit more efficient where we can. And uh, Jim's done a great job with that. So we are trying to lower those costs here. So um, I appreciate the comments and, and um, about the paratransit fare, so. So yeah. one other question on here, Kevin, is um, do you know if there are plans for a park and ride facility in Carlsberg, maybe an agreement for land use with Graywell for PUD? Um, that is not in, in place, but here I have something even better. Um, I'm trying to um, procure property just off of River Road um, there on the north uh, east corner of 101 where the off ramp is, the River Road off ramp. Uh, there's 4.8 acres that Wazad owns it's, uh, that uh, is held for Qualm Transit. And I'm negotiating with WASDOT right now on what we can do to um, Secure that property and improve that area. So that's a better location in my mind for a park and ride because that's at the end of the line. Uh, Carlsberg really isn't a very good area for park, uh, park and ride. And if we have to come off of the main route and deviate from that, um, that every two minutes, three minutes here and there takes a lot of time and starts uh, breaking up the, the uh, express time of that commuter going back and forth on the 30 minute um, headways. So, can you, so that is in the works. Can you describe a little bit more where that location is? Is it at the north, yeah. east, northwest, southeast corner? So yeah. River Road and Highway 101, you said? Yeah, so if you go over the overpass and you're heading north and you look to your right, there's 4.8 acres in a field there that's okay. directly across from Applebee's. Got it, so, yep. Yeah, and so we're... Right now, we're putting together a feasibility study on a, on the cost and usage of that um, that we'll be hopefully uh, getting out here in the next couple months. Um, and then that also includes the mountainside at Deer Park, which the county owns a property, and that's a, a spot held for us for park and ride as well. So 
I'm really uh, motivated here to get some additional parking rights for us that um, at, at each end of the, the two communities, so. And so would that support or serve people that, you know, were uh, using the MAP clinic as well? The, um, if, well, if we were to uh, successfully, if we're successful in getting that property and putting a parking right there at that location, we may have commuters and our straight shot staged there and then shuttles would uh, bring people in and out of the, the city pot. This is a you know potential how this would look. So uh, the dynamics may change on how we serve the swim area. And um, you know anytime we can keep a large heavy duty bus out of running through downtown, that just increases the time periods and stuff and the efficiency. So, um, but again, that'll have to go through our um, our service committee to design that. And first we got to get the property. So that's what we're working on right now. So. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So also part of our um, consultant um, analysis here, our comprehensive analysis was uh, getting, we had a, a project advisory committee um, made up of uh, Oh, uh, representatives from different businesses and organizations uh, throughout the county. And uh, this was kind of the exercise we went through was um, kind of nice to support what I think we thought internally here with at Qualm Transit was nice for folks to look at this from another angle. And uh, this is just what they came up with as in ranking um, later evening services would be um, was more popular with with this group, um, more frequent um, service and better uh, connections of on existing routes, additional Saturday service, Sunday service was down on the list and early morning service as well. Um, so if I was to rank the um, the types of service improvements, um, this is how I would rank them. So it was kind of nice to, to see that from um, a, another uh, group eyes taking a look at how we provide services. So that's that and just some uh, additional insights from that group. Um, the uh, further consideration for some more on-demand service, which we, that's how we serve SQUIM right now. Um, have facilitating crosstown travel without transfers. We're definitely taking a look at that and then better connections to, to uh, popular tourist routes. Um, and then some of the members also were um, asking for improved and enhanced amenities at transit stops, which we are trying to uh, continually do that with solar lighting and shelter and, you know, uh, additional shelters in areas that don't have them. So, um, right on track with kind of our plans and just some additional feedback from that group here um of course this is kind of upside down the most popular is at the bottom but um the top talking about raising fares i mean that was not as popular uh pursuing partnerships to support uh, more options and routes it was in the middle of the list mid of the list there focus on populations that historically underserved by current transit system um, expanding opportunity, opportunities to attract ridership from other groups was uh, higher on their list. And then the highest one here was improved service and connections for current service riders, which I think everybody can agree on as um, a popular theme. So design priorities that... Uh, <clears throat> came out of the, from the, to work with the consultant. So some of the recommendations were um, better connections between inner city routes to allow cross town county trips, uh, better frequency on the uh, service on the major corridors, again, that's the, the uh, routes mainly within uh, Port Angeles, extended service hours in the evening, um, Crosstown services in Port Angeles and Squim, on-demand services in low-density and low-demand areas, even headways on rural and intercity routes, 
simpler and more direct routes and continuous service schedules and fill gaps in schedules where we do have some gaps in schedules. Um, so with these themes um, that, that the consultant gave us, uh, this kind of drives what our review committee is looking at this time and um, where we're going here, potentially going in the future, which I'll um, cover some more here in the later slides. Um, so the consultant came up with some design options for our in-town service. And again, these have not changed for years. Um, they're they're uh, currently a loop type service. So uh, example is our west side goes down Marine Drive where there really isn't anybody to pick up, goes up Hill Street and around in the west side and then comes back down, um, eventually down the, the truck route. But um, having um, these types of crosstown design options to consider get people um, where they want to go faster and so they're not on the bus as long to get to the to the uh, areas within the community and then um, we still are in pretty close proximity to where we normally are right now um, where people get on and off because it's ex expectation that people will uh, walk a few blocks to get to the transit so this is one of the design options we are working on that looks um, you know, myself and staff, this is really favorable. Another design option in Port Angeles for crosstown routes is, um, would be to run our uh, 26 out to the west end or west side of town, turn around and come straight back again and have a route 20 that serves the other side of town um, in, in more of a straight out fashion and back again. So, Kevin, with the um, airline service that's going to be starting up here, has, is there any potential for um, support for people that fly in to get to downtown uh, Port Angeles or other areas on the peninsula? Yep. So we've already, I've already met with Dan and we worked that out in advance and um, how we're handling that right now is we're deviating from our, I think it's a west side route that deviates to the airport. And I know the service has not started, but we're already getting calls for, um, for that service. So we, um, we used to serve the airport years ago on a regular basis, and it was very low ridership. And so then we went to the deviated service. And so we're going to, we start out again with that deviated service. If this continues to grow, then we are going to have to look at adding it to our regular route. So I believe today it's going to be much more popular than it was, you know, 10 plus years ago, um, just because uh, the ability to get downtown and, and um, transits view differently now and used by uh, uh, more folks, I believe today than it was in, in the past. So um, I think that it's, it's going to just grow from there. So, but that's how we're serving that right now. So, um, here's some uh, design options for lower LWA route. So um, currently um, we have, we end up on a few of the trips uh, run out to lower LWA and make that trip. So that increases times on, on some of the current routes. Um, this would be more of a, um, from the main 101 route here, we'd be able to um, run directly to the lower L1 back. And, uh, but in this scenario, we, we need to coordinate with the, with the tribe because um, they, uh, we can't just go change it. So we need some further coordination with them on, the, on this option. But the, uh, the other thing that this, we've already had discussions with the tribe, the planner there, um, about how to serve um, their expanded serve, uh, footprint and their medical center there better. So um, we'll have, be having some more discussions here, but this is a, a, a good starting point for us. And I, um, this may satisfy um, the needs better for their community as well. So we're partnering with them um, as well during this exercise. Um, one thing that we're Offering in SQUIM is a dollarized service, which is basically micro transit. So um, that's Monday through Friday. So if, um, you can call and schedule a trip and it'll take you to the nearest bus stop or your destination, whichever is closer in SQUIM. And we, we implemented that several years ago because of the difficulty in um, serving that community with a, a shuttle and 
uh, getting to all the residential areas and shopping everything without having to ride the bus for two hours to get through that. So nobody wants to be on a bus for two hours in a small community like that. So the dollar ride has served that very well. Um, we've already had a plan in place to implement that service in Forks as of last year. We held off on that to wait until the um, consultant completed the um, this project so that we uh, could get further um, uh, support from for this. And again, the uh, consultant immediately identified that the, this type of service and forks would be an uh, advantage over what we have now. Um, so we're looking at expanding the micro service dial ride in SQUIM and implementing that in forks as well. Um, And that would more than likely, um, we would use an app, uh, phone app to, um, for people to utilize that service. So, which is very common with many transits. I mean, microtransit's been around for years. Um, I know Jim's had a lot of experience with that at some of the other transit systems he's been with. So, so another option here is our de design options for the, uh, um, Squim Bay and Diamond Point. Um, this one's going to need a lot more consideration um, because the Jamestown Tribe pays for four trips of the Route 50 going from Squim to their campus um, during the weekdays. So we're not, we can't just go change up what they're, they're paying for that service. So they're supporting that. So we need to definitely coordinate with them and not compromise their, the service that they're paying for through a grant. Um, the Diamond Point ridership there's the density down there is is uh, pretty low so um we're, we're just gonna have to take a real close look with this and coordinate with the tribe before making any changes here if we if we do make changes so service change scenarios um we kind of broke this down into three categories well the consultant did for us um and i'll have more detail in the next three slides but um uh, they recommend a conservative scenario, which is a 5% increase to service hours, 12% increase to service miles, and about $300,000 additional cost per year. The next scenario is about $600,000 additional per year. And then the aggressive scenario, which is close to a million dollars um, per year. And so in the conservative scenario, um, this modifies the um, Port Angeles routes um, to have the single route alignment and the crosstown connections. And again, this actually may have a cost savings for us as well um, by doing this. We will have to look at that. Um, I don't believe there's going to be any additional cost in those, in those route alignments. Eliminate the loops, um, which is something we always try to do here in with transit. Um, and this adds missing trips to urban routes and schedule, uh, schedules to provide and maintain consistent frequency and service throughout the day. And it reduces vehicle idle time uh, from the current average of 34% to 27%. So some, like I said, some of this has some uh, cost savings built into it. This also implements a new route 12 to Lower Elwha and uh, implements micro transit service and forks and squim. And so this is about a $300,000 additional cost. This moderate scenario um, takes everything that's in that uh, conservative scenario and adds to it. And this would actually add um, later service to the in-town Port Andrews routes and extend the frequencies on the Highway 101 commuter until 9 p.m. Um, this has been most popular with staff, myself, and our board. And we are currently working on our transit development plan for next year and our budget. And the board has directed us to look at um, a budget of about $600,000 of additional services for next year, which is great. I mean, I've the only two significant additions to this service that I've uh, re recalled in the last 40 years is that uh, we annexed Forks in about 1984 to the, the West End. We annexed the West End in, and then we added a straight shot service in uh, June of uh, 2017. So this is kind of exciting that after this uh, analysis was complete or through the, the process, and now we're able to actually implement some of these, these uh, um, scenarios to um, improve our transit system. And this again, looks to, to pencil out to be sustainable. 
um, with the funds we have. So um, throughout the future. The aggressive scenario at about 900,000, um, this um, implements additional services, but um, I'm not so sure that this may lack efficiency. So in a sense, overbuilding our system. Um, also, when you start talking about adding this amount of service, it also uh, starts impacting um, other, other areas as well. The need for additional buses. Um, again, staffing has been an issue with this. And so this, I'm not saying this isn't gonna happen someday in the future, but right now we are not prepared to, to tackle this because there's additional built-in costs to this and challenges that uh, I don't think that we can handle. And again, as a you know, question if it's achievable and if it's even sustainable in the future. So um, this may be a less bang for your buck type of scenario. So we're, we're not really interested in this one right now. Um, and how do we fund the service investments? Um, so some of the, um, Examples in there that'll reduce some of our idle time. That's going to um, create some savings. Um, revisions to the fare structure. Again, this is something that needs further discussion. We're going to first look at the service improvements, and we will have some discussion about fares. But this, we're not uh, uh, gung ho to, to change anything right now in that area. And funding reserves. Um, this is actually how we will be paying for the services out of the reserves from the additional federal funds that we're receiving, the grant funding we're receiving uh, from the CARES and the CRISA Act. And then increasing sales tax collection is another op option here. Uh, currently, we collect six tenths percent of the sales tax. That's our revenue for sales tax. We have the ability to ask up to 9.9%, percent um, but um, I'm, we're not um, really considering this one at this time because why we would be asking for further sales tax increase when we have funding um, in our reserves to cover this. So uh, just an example, each one-tenth of percent of the sales tax we receive is worth 1.4 million. And uh, some other the considerations um, as we work through these scenarios, again, is staffing. I mean, we have to kind of phase this in a bit because we can't just run out as everybody is having difficulties hiring employees, uh, us as well. Um, we have to consider the equipment we have um, and our, our facility needs here, the parking, we're maxed out up here at the truck route at our main facility. And also um, as we move forward in the future and plan for making these uh, some of these improvements, uh, presenting these to the board for approval in uh, 2022, is uh, we could be delayed due to um, additional COVID uh, restrictions um, that we'd be faced with in the future. So our next steps here is we have a final report from Walker Consultants that should be in our hands today, I believe. We got a draft last week and found a couple errors in, in their report, so they corrected those. We're gonna get that out to the board. This should be available on our webpage soon. Um, we are going to present the um, current recommendations from the consultant to our service review committee. Uh, then they will come up with um, the different scenarios and the changes to our system. And then we will uh, bring that to the board and we will determine um, what levels of investment and the prioritization of, of the improvements. And through that process, we will seek public comment on the proposed improvements. So we will not just have a public hearing at our meeting, we will set up some, pub, some public outreach um, so that we can hear from the public and explain to them the changes. So um, very important in the process. And um, <clears throat> that covers that part of the presentation there. Um, and Colleen, you had your um, invitation to talk a little bit about emissions and some other things. And I know it's quarter till and I can quickly do that or I can answer questions, either one. Yeah, so um, I'm curious about um, the, like I know city of Seattle or King County, maybe it is, has been investing in electric buses and there's all sorts of hybrid and you know propane can you describe 
a little bit about your fleet and if there are grant opportunities available at the state level or maybe from the Climate Commitment Act or something like that where there's, uh, do you have any plans mm -hmm. to um, Certainly. change your fleet so you're reducing emissions? Yeah, so, so some of the plans have already taken place. So we actually, our entire pro, or, uh, paratransit fleet is all propane buses. So there's 20 buses that are all propane. Um, we also had a portion of our van pool fleet was propane as well um, for a period of time there. We still have a few of those uh, operating. Um, we recently have received uh, grant funding for, I'd say about 19 diesel buses to replace very old or older um, diesel buses that were um, you know, not even close to today's emissions. So by doing that, um, we received 10 heavy duties already. We have six more in order and three uh, destined for the straight shot. Those are uh, you know, clean, cleaner diesel buses with the latest diesel emissions with, and we're using biodiesel with those as well. Um, part of that um, planning process, in, when we're looking at electric, um, the range was not, uh, you know, uh, didn't satisfy what we need in the area. A lot of things, the cost is, I mean, quite frankly, the electric buses cost um, near almost twice as much. There's a lot of other factors in, in that involved. But what I, we really didn't want to do here is, is put electric buses out for a portion of our service, have to pull them off the road and then put old dirty diesels out and just counterproductive what we're trying to do here in reducing emissions. So we have set ourselves up in a good position right now and been successful in replacing old diesels. So we got a new diesel fleet out there in the heavy duty side of things. We have applied for two grant fund opportunities for electric and got turned down because typically those go for the big um, to uh, bigger cities where um, the pollution's higher. Um, and so uh, the rural systems is very difficult for us to compete in that arena, but we've been trying. Um, we also have more most recently been looking at and we have a lot of enthusiasm about the hydrogen electric buses, which have a greater range. They fuel mm -hmm. in about eight minutes. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, more positive things about that that fit within our um, fleet makeup and um, our ability to meet the ranges of our routes. So we've I've um, had a couple of presentations to our board on that, um, and we are preparing to do a feasibility study um, on the hydrogen electric um, next year so that we can put all the costs together and um, look at what, and analyze what that really means going that direction. So right now, yes, we have to move towards electric or hydrogen electric. Um, and at the end of the day, I can see us having a, um, a combined fleet of possibly some electrics and some hydrogen electrics in, in the future. But we're uh, moving, that, moving towards that direction right now. Um, and it does cost more. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it simply does. So, so is that something where, like, how many megawatts would you use a year? I, I know um, McKinley's going to have about eight to ten megawatts that they'll be producing that'll be green energy, and then there's another company that's looking at uh, our community that would produce somewhere between four to ten megawatts. Is that something? that um, somehow Qualum Transit could connect with that green energy produ production? Potentially, yes. I'm working with a, a consultant that works with Ballard Energy. And so um, we're trying to identify one in part of the feasibility um, study, the purpose of that too is identify our fuel sources for that. So liquid, hi liquid hydrogen um, would um, serve us very well for expanding in that area in the future. Um, the cost of a hydrogen um, fuel cell station is between three to five million and it's somewhere in that neighborhood. We want to identify those costs a little closer, but um, supply is very important to us because we can't, we, you know, having dependable, reliable services is, is number one on our list up there, right up there with safety. So we have to be able to, um, we can't have brand new million dollar buses sitting in our yard here and unable to get hydrogen fuel to run them. So there's so many um, factors involved in that and that's part of that so 
Um, we do know that we can handle a, a, up to 10 or 12 electric buses here at our facility at, with the um, individual charging stations that would be uh, with a charge management system. So we are going, we would have to upgrade our transformer, the, um, the power lines from the um, substation to here are currently adequate to support that. Um, and it takes about three years once you order electric bus for it to be on site. So this is gonna be a very slow process, but we are working um, to get all the questions answered so that we know what we're getting into because it's a huge investment. But um, mm -hmm. so I actually have a meeting with Thomas Hunter from the city of Port Angeles next week. We're gonna be talking about some things and one of them is hydrogen, what their future plans are. Uh, Lindsay has been very uh, supportive in making sure we connect in that area too. So public agencies can take advantage of um, the same fuel supply or source or what have you, then we can, we can kind of work towards that in the future if there's opportunity there, so. Great. Yeah, I mean, we don't have, I'm sure hydrogen is probably the better product, but we don't have many other users for hydrogen. And it seems like, uh, you know, I, I don't think McKinley right now has a purchaser for their green energy. Mm -hmm. So it would be really nice to, um, you know, support local companies that are trying to do what they can to, you know, in the climate arena. Yeah. That's yeah. my thought. Yeah, but certainly we're going to have to work together with others and, and you know, um, <clears throat> as we move forward here, um, again, it's a long process. I, I'm more excited about the hydrogen electric just for the fact that uh, you have a 300 mile range, uh, it takes eight minutes to fuel. And um, with electric buses, you know, there's claims of 200 mile range, but reality it's 130 to 160, depending on the temperature outside the hills, the terrain, and, um, and why that bus is sitting on a charger for three and a half hours, nobody can work on it either. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of, um, Got it. a lot of challenges built into that. Uh, in those technologies, but we are uh, we are moving forward in that direction at, at some point here um, in the near future. So, so I know we don't have natural gas up here, but out of Satsop, there's express natural gas that trucks mm -hmm. compressed natural gas to the Port Townsend uh, paper mill and to McKinley, and they're probably doing it for Interfor going forward. Is that a possibility? Are there, are there buses that run on compressed natural gas? There are buses that run on that. Um, just because of our location makes that extremely difficult. Um, example, our propane fuel station, I think, is, is one of the only auto fuel stations in the area. So when our pump breaks down, you can't just go down to the local propane place and fuel a vehicle. So it's a specialized pump system. Um, and so we have that challenge built into just op operating the propane. Um, I think, um, you know, CNG is an option. There's other transits that run it, but I, I don't think that, uh, I think bringing that to the peninsula here for um, vehicles is probably farther off than hydrogen, bringing hydrogen electric into the area. Okay, got it, thanks. So I've asked a million questions. Um, does anybody else have any questions that they want to ask of Kevin or Jim or Lindsay? Or Lindsay, do you want to share a few words? Well, I'll just add, you know, we, we talk a lot about the individual fuel for the buses, um, but I think it's valuable to think of our whole transportation energy system as a system. Uh, you know, when we can take just you know, one or two more cars off the road on a trip between Forks and Port Angeles or Port Angeles and Squim or Port Angeles and Seattle, uh, that's making a huge impact on total greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation system. So I've, I've been thinking of it more, more as how do we create a, a public transit system through Calm Transit that people will use more. Um, and I've been less focused on the particular fuel that we're using or energy source that we're using for the buses, because um, you know, from a from a cost benefit perspective, the, the more bus riders, I think that's where we get our biggest our biggest savings from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. But I've been really enjoying working with um, Kevin and Jim 
and everyone else in Cloud Transit, this comprehensive operational analysis. The analogy I've made for it is it's like we're in a, in a planing boat, but we're going so slow that we're acting like a displacement haul boat. And uh, this is going to get us up to a speed that we're, I think we're going to see a lot more ridership on Cloud and Transit because it's going to be much more of a, uh, a system that solves issues like how do you get to your final destination, not just to the bus depot. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's always that last mile that's the issue. So, um, yeah, I see state, Steve has asked a question, I think, in, a, in the slides, Steve, um, they pre he presented that early on. So we'll have that on our website and you can see Kevin's slides. So we'll get that up on um, the, the Choose Column First Coffee with Colleen tab. We'll get the recording here and the slides up. Jim, was there anything you wanted to add? Not hearing anything. I think then we will probably call it a morning unless Kevin, you had a few closing comments you wanted to make? Yeah, um, no, thank you for the opportunity, Colleen. We've got a lot of uh, new and exciting things we're exploring here. If anybody is interested, our transit development plan here will be adopted um, this, this month, um, should be adopted. The board, um, it, it'll be in front of our board and you can go to um, our website and um, look at planning and our transit development plan will be there and it'll list uh, a lot of the things we're looking at over the next six years five to six years here. And um, there's a lot on there. I mean, I could go on and on all day about different things that we're exploring. So um, it's an exciting time for us. And I'm, I'm looking forward to having this opportunity that we we, we have these funds um, in our hands now that are need to be used for transit. And we are going to be able to put those out on the road and make this a better transit system. And it's been a long time uh, coming, I think. So I appreciate it. So. Well, yeah, with the Climate Commitment Act and the low carbon fuel standard, um, that's going to put a lot of pressure on gasoline prices in our state. And I think people will, when they get that kind of shock at the pump, when these things go into effect and then just increase over time, I think people are going to be looking at other options for transportation, even though you know, uh, mass transit isn't considered as convenient, certainly, as hopping in your own car. But I think there's going to be a lot of pressure um, on people's wallets to get people to change their behavior in their transportation mode. Anyway, with that, um, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us. And I'm going to stop recording.